I, I tried to be Kelly Silver for one week. Nah. How'd that go? <laughs> <laughs> How'd that go, Kelly? <laughs> Let's rock and roll. We're already rocking and rolling. <laughs> Miss Kelly Osborne, thank you. Good thank to see you. You look amazing. Thank you so much, and person. thank you for having me. Yeah. Oh, that's such a nice compliment. Thanks for true. <laughs> we got the photo of people. You'll see it when it goes up. I was, we were looking for your photos, and I go, the one with the long purple hair. This is my favorite <laughs> color. I was like, wow, that looks great. Thank you. Um, but you, you know, you're here. We're gonna be very vulnerable. We appreciate that, especially because the impact on those that are listening, mm -hmm. watching. We saw it today on your Instagram. Yeah, yeah. I had a stumble. Yeah. But I think it was a blessing in disguise for me. Um, I was running on my own self-will for mm. too long because I got happy. And I am that classic addict that is like, oh, I'm happy. Everything's great now. I can do whatever the fuck I want. Yeah. And it took one person saying one thing to me that let the addict in my head be like, fuck it and because I was dealing with a lot of stress like everyone has this year yeah, sure. like the pandemic is if you're in the program the pandemic has really screwed a lot of people yeah. because we need our fellowship we need our meetings we need the program and, and the way that it was and then all of a sudden that gets ripped away from you yeah. and you're like how do I start again and then you become a classic victim and you start looking for excuses and looking for the excuse and then I finally found the excuse I need and I took it mm -hmm. and the thing that destroys me is that I lost my time Why because you... my ego was like I've got this many years and I've been ah. sober for this much time and then I realized that's not what this is about mm -hmm. yeah. that's not what this is about at all and the reason why I was like, it happened, it did not last long. It was a quick bender. And the reason I had to be honest about it is because this journey is not easy. And recovery is, and this disease, you relapse sometimes, no one's perfect. It is one day at a time. And I wasn't doing one day at a time. Yeah. I wasn't, and I wasn't using my resources. I stopped calling my sponsor. She's is off that, camera. Is that over there? <laughs> Beautiful artwork, uh, by yeah. the way. I stopped but, calling my sponsor. I stopped going to meetings. I stopped seeing my therapist because I was like, I have the most amazing boyfriend in the world. All my dreams are coming true. All the jobs that I wanted to get that I got because I was sober right. and was capable to be present enough to do them. And then I was like, oh my God, all your dreams are coming true. You're going to have to destroy it now. You're not good enough. You don't deserve this. And I let it get the better of me. And then it everything i'm not good in situations like most addicts that you can't control mm -hmm. and everything that went on recently with my family got too much for me i couldn't sure. take it and then with everything that's been going on in this world and never knowing if you're allowed to say something or not because i just wake up wanting to be a good person and help people and work for equality and work for just the right to be who you are no matter what and when you have no control over that because the rules are changing every day. It makes you feel like, what the fuck am I supposed to do? And then I was dealing with my dad's Parkinson's and I was dealing with, am I ready to be working again? Is this what I want? And everything just got too much and I fucking crumbled. Yeah. And I needed to do it because it made me realize, I don't, that's not, the, the addict in me wants me to be drunk alone, unhappy, no boyfriend, no friends, sitting in my apartment by myself. That's where I am most comfortable. Yeah. Drinking. And in I isolation. was just like, in complete isolation, drinking and sleeping and not like, not being fucking human in any way. And that lasted for one week until the truth is, the, my boyfriend looked at me and I could tell he was like, you're disgusting. And I was like, oh my God, what the fuck am I doing? Like, what the fuck am I doing? And mm. the next day I was like, nope, done. 
I have entered into an outpatient again because I think I need a little bit of extra help. I think it's really important to do that when you relapse. Yeah, absolutely. So I've signed up for different therapies this time, which I'm really excited about because I realized that a lot of my um, issues with the ability to stay on track is expectation. Sure. And you cannot fucking have expectations of people because you can't control them. Yep. Even the people who are meant to do the jobs that they're supposed to do, you can't expect them to do it. And that's where I get hung up. And I'm like, but you're, you're meant to do this for me. It goes back to the control ego yeah. area. It, the control ego, and that's me. And that's where I'm like, fuck this. And right. it makes me crumble and I run. That's why I let this guy pick what's on the TV when we uh, travel. <laughs> Because if not, I get stuck watching fucking NASCAR all the time. Man. <laughs> you a NASCAR thing. guy? Uh, anything motorsports I love. But no, what I wanted to say too, and what we had talked about before we got started, was when you, how you put it on your Instagram, how you owned it immediately, addressed it, and fixed it. Like that was really admirable and really mature and really just like, wow, good for you. That's fucking incredible. Like that's owning it. Okay, for me, that's really important. Yeah. I don't want to be a role model, but I am now. Yeah, for sure. It wasn't something that I was trying to be. I was always the fuck up. So how the fuck am I suddenly now? Oh, she's a role model. Oh, God, that's a lot of pressure. And I cannot, because I respect the program so much and I respect what sobriety has given me and what it has taught me and how it has allowed me to grow up because you stop fucking mentally developing the day you start becoming yep. addicted to something. Mm -hmm. yep. So in three years, I had to go from being 13 to 36. Mm -hmm, yeah. And you're just like, okay, I, I, I have a lot of growing up to do and I did it, but that you have that angel and you have that devil and sometimes the devil just gets too loud. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so much of that shit, I, I know for me, it was an interesting process. And when I started drinking, granted I was much older I'd really you know people like you didn't really drink till you were 21 no I was a pretty good guy I was the guy at the party oh I was the, drinking at 13 the, uh, like, no, yeah. this is getting publicized <laughs> you know yeah. I got the, I got the drunk people home from the high school party but when I noticed one when, when it was about there was a reactivation of trauma in like around 26 27 that's when everything hit yeah. the fucking fan so so much of it is based in trauma yes so much of it is based in trauma but I also like for me, it's so important to be honest because I really believe you are only as sick as your secrets. And, and I know that that's a cliche saying that everyone says in the program, but I, I believe that. It's true. And I am, if people look up to me, I'm not going to lie to them and say I'm Cali sober. I don't believe in that. I think it's wrong. I think it sends a terrible message because if people look up to you and they're like, well, she's doing that, why can't I? That doesn't fucking work for everyone. And if you choose to do that, do that in closed doors. Don't do that in public. It sets a terrible fucking example. Yeah. A terrible example because there are so many young people that are struggling with this and don't fucking understand mm -hmm. and have been trapped in their homes without any resources. And what do they look to? They look to their iPhones. They look to, um, sorry, I, I use the iPhone, whatever, smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they look on their computers. They look to people who are being open about their struggles and when you're not being honest about what you're going through, it it creates a new standard that's unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think there's a big perception. I have uh, had an interesting situation within the last week. Someone that I care very near and dear for. I don't think she'd mind me saying, but anyway, um, six days, and the attitude's like, "Well, but I'm not doing what you're doing." It's like you did it one, like. You did six days. What are you talking about? That's fucking awesome. Yeah. Like you don't even understand. They don't get it. Like, they don't get, okay, it's, just it's, getting through 24 fucking hours and not numbing yourself mm -hmm. is for an addict a miracle every single day. And that's why we say one day at a time. Yeah. For it's a miracle every single day. And one of the people that I work with a lot in sobriety is a guy named DJ Fat Tony in London. If you ever get the chance to interview him, he's the best. And like, he's got this magical way of like, when I, I call him and I told him everything that was going on, and he's got this way of turning everything into humor so that you can see the funny side of it and then get through. And he's just like sat there laughing at me, calling me a twat and being like, why did you do it? I'm like, I know, I know. But the point is like, today I'm sober and I'm happy. Mm -hmm. I let myself shame spiral for a little bit because I think that as an addict, you have to do that so that you can remember the pain. 
mm. because the pain is the remembering of what that felt like is also something that keeps me sober because I don't want to feel like that yeah. at all. And when you get to the point where you're just going to surrender and do the work, I'm not looking forward to the work that I have to do because I realize that I have my control issues and yeah. was <laughs> like was my coming. ego and the, um, you know, terminal uniqueness that I have to work on. Yeah, but right. I, I'm getting there. Right, isn't that the thing? <laughs> my, my sponsor, ironically, he's he's been on the pot. He became my sponsor after he was a guest, um, and and he was giving me shit about that stuff with with the ego and everything. And he's like, so tell me about the last time. It was, you know, my best friend's mom passed away unexpectedly. Healthy woman. You know, kind of, he goes, well, well, it's normal, and but that got it mentality and mm -hmm. and. I said something, well, my situation's unique. And he just, motherfucker. He goes, how? How's it unique? Did you drink? Did you ever get really sick? Did you cause problems? Did it cause you, you know, did you go to jail? Did you, yeah, all that. Okay, shut the fuck up. There's nothing, nothing unique, unique about that. There is absolutely nothing unique about that. But it, what I've learned to do in situations like that is I made mistakes in, in my recovery with other people with trying to help them. Like one of the lessons I've recently learned is when somebody has relapsed and they ask you not to tell someone, don't do that. Yeah. Don't do that. And someone's relapsed, you have to tell the, the people that are in their lives mm -hmm. because it's, it, you are people pleasing and you are not helping that person and you're putting yourself in a situation where unconsciously you're participating in it because you're not like whether you say I don't want to be a part of it or whatever because I stayed quiet because I didn't know how to handle it things got really bad for my friend and there's a part of me that f feels bad about it mm -hmm. like a, like very bad about it but it's a lesson that you learn like this is how we learn how to help and protect others in our group and that's mm -hmm. what I love about the program and anybody who is in any sort of program or group is that there's nobody else that understands what you're going through than the people in that room. Yep. And you can say whatever the fuck you want and they get it, even if it sounds stupid. Like I'll give you an example. I got an electric car because my mind told me that I didn't deserve to be a person pumping gas. How fucking insane is now that? Now you mean the ego side that like you were above pumping gas? No, or not you above. Or worthy? No, I wasn't worthy to be around people and like doing normal people things because I was just a piece of shit. And like, that's the kind of things that my mind told me that I wow. couldn't be around people because you're not good enough. Right. And then when, and I it like weird stuff like that. And I'd be like, that's fucking insane. And I remember when I told everybody in this one, in my women's meeting, about six women came up to me afterwards and said, I did the same thing. I have never heard that. I've one. never heard that either. Like it's this whole thing where like, because I, I think I got self-induced agoraphobia. So mm. like being around mm. anybody or thinking like, like doing things like when you're in the public eye and you look in magazines and you see it, they're just like us. Yeah, yeah. You know, anything that was like, they're just like us. I was like, you're not worthy. You're not good enough. Like, you're not just like yeah. them. You can't, like, I didn't go to a grocery store for years. Like weird things that like stopped me. Like I, I like never thought I was good enough. Sure. 5150 is power. The power to overcome. The power to persevere. The power to set your life on a course for success. When you're faced with the challenges life throws at you, you focus and do what is needed to go beyond what is required. So stand up, stand firm, believe, Make it happen and live through the madness, knocking doors down along the way. We are 5150. Which is interesting that you share that because I'm sure people's, why I asked the perception be like, oh, they're too good to do these normal no. things. But for you, it was this arresting of just... You're, you don't deserve it. You're right. not good enough. You don't deserve your achievements because you're just someone's kid. Everyone just thinks it's nepotism. And the truth is, that's not the fucking case at all. Right. Like, I left, I did my own thing and carved out my own career. And that's just people being jealous. And it took me a while to fucking get my head around that because I believed everything that they were saying. And I was like, you don't deserve your achievements. You're not good enough. It's only because of who your parents are. 
And to break that cycle was really difficult, but I did. Sure. Well, you should, because your voice is fuck. Let me tell you, have yourself a Merry Little Christmas. When you sang that on the Osbournes years ago, <laughs> we still listen to that every year. No, you do I not. I swear. And my do you know that that was that a too? one take live recording in my fucking living room? It was really? fucking yes. perfect. Thank I swear. You. And I'm like, no, you got to hear Kelly's. And then they're like, what? Like my uncle's or what? And then I put it on and it's just so like I don't think powerful. anyone has ever told me that I they love it. I'm to obsessed that. with it. It's oh so my God, I love I you I put it on that. YouTube and I just play it. I'm like, shh, listen. <laughs> It's, it's like deep. She gets powerful. It's like there's passion up. behind it. I love it. So <laughs> thank you. We're being holly and thank jolly you. here. Shut I up. mean, yes, your parents are awesome. But them aside, your voice is just fucking phenomenal. So, thank you. I yeah, really appreciate absolutely. that. It's well, and that's a tough. That, I was really excited to tell you that. By the way, <laughs> every year I listen to it. Every year. That's one of the things that you know I couldn't. Um, that I was curious to understand your thoughts and feelings on it because then she, I didn't realize it was young as thirteen. Of course, you know, we saw you and your brother uh, on TV, so we had the perception. And then, of course, uh, uh, Manny Dave, right? Was yeah, it? Manny Dave. Okay. So big Dave, Rave. Big I still Dave. talk to Big Rave all the time. So dealing with you guys as kids and all that stuff, but it's interesting you brought up the people-pleasing thing. When do you think that started? And the reason I ask that is because your parents were public eye. And granted, it's kind of like, the, I love that. That's what I love about them. They just kind of could be, you know, fuck all and... Uh, here I am, I do what I do, but did that start kind of with some of that stuff? Do you think being in the public eye? Because a, a big mis... I think, to be totally honest with you, it's a trait that I got from my father. Mm. I think a lot of personality traits are inherited from your parents. Agreed. Um, and I think it's part of my ism in the sense that, like... I don't want to piss anyone off. I spent so much of my fucking life being a dick and pissing people off. And then when you're on your road to redemption, you're like, okay, how do I handle this? I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. And it's something for me that is like a huge challenge. I need to break that habit because it doesn't put my sobriety first and it doesn't put me first yeah. at all. And it's, it's something that you think that you're doing the right thing, but you're not ever, you're not. And it's having the confidence just to say no. And then where my people pleasing got worse is that when I joined the program and they're like, if someone asks you to do something, you do it. Yeah. And so I, I was doing all of these things that I didn't really want to do because I was just doing what I was told. If they literally, if they told me go outside and pick up that dog shit and all the litter from the street, <laughs> I would do it. Like I was just in that place of like, I am fully surrendered. Literally whatever you tell me to do, I will do. I was at my as interesting as working uh, step four and five with my sponsor because he's new to me, and um, you know we're laying it out, and he's like, "You do realize what your fucking issue is here?" And I go, "What?" Which I've talked more about on the podcast, and he goes, "Boundaries, man." You've same got, as me. Same as me. Same like, as me. <laughs> you've got you've got no boundaries. The shit that happened to you and all that. He goes, "It's fucking boundaries." He's like, "It's it's boundaries," but that's the problem in my family. We're like because we love each other so much and we're all fucking people pleasers. There are no yeah. goddamn boundaries. So it creates chaos sure. at all times. And it, that's something that's really important for me is my boundaries. Like, no, I'm not doing that. I will do this, but you know, that makes me uncomfortable. And one of my things that was always really hard was that I'm terrible at asking for help. Ooh. Terrible at it. Mm -hmm. Like actually fucking terrible. Do you, did you carry a lot of feeling like a burden? Yes. Yes. Oh, there she goes again. We're doing it again. Yeah. And so that's why this time I'm like, I ain't waiting for you to tell me what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you and I am putting a cap on it and we are moving the fuck on because I, there's no way I'm living like this. You know, I, I want a family. I, I want more out of life than sitting in a fucking room getting drunk mm -hmm. by myself. Yeah. And like, I'm telling you, it was that one way. Eric looked at me and I was just like, fuck this, I'm not doing this anymore. But that, was some... the, that was the mm. ending call kind of thing, yeah. But there's something about the difference between a person that comes into your life, or t tell me, for me, mm -hmm. it's a person that comes into your life that loves you as opposed to your parents, because your parents just fucking in inherently love you, or your siblings, I got a, br I got a brother. My I brother a... is like my rock in yeah. sobriety. 
my brother is that to me like I I go to him for everything in that I mean tomorrow he has 18 years so oh good. good for him yeah 18 years and I wish I could be like him my sobriety is very different and that's okay yeah it and but I do I wish I could be more um like you tell Jack a rule, he sticks to it. You tell me a rule, and I'll try and figure out how to make that rule different. <laughs> we love shortcuts. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, that's what I fucking do, and there's a problem. So I'm like, oh, okay. So that's where I get in my own way in my recovery as well. Yeah. Like it took me like fucking a year and a half to do my fourth step. <laughs> it was bad. You didn't want to. You didn't want to write that list, did you? For those who don't know, it, 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 yeah. one of the four steps. You can look it up to find out more. I didn't want to write this because it made me angry. And I, it was so long that I was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah, but angry at other people or angry at yourself or both? Okay, so this is the thing. Angry at myself for letting myself get to a place where people could take advantage of me. Mm -hmm. And where I, where I knew better. Mm -hmm. I did know better. I just didn't mm -hmm. want it. Yeah. Um, but angry at other people because the victim in me at that time, the addict in me, told me that it was their fault that I was like this. But it's sure. not their fault that I'm like this. It's my fault that I'm like this. These are my problems. These are my issues. Of course, there's contributing factors, mm -hmm. and that's where the boundaries come in. Yeah. And that's where you just got to be like, I love you. And this is for my friend. This is this is friends, family, colleagues. Like you should see the fucking emails I sent out today. I'm like, this is my schedule. This is what I'm doing for my recovery. If anything you have put on my schedule competes with this, I am not doing it. I don't care how much money it is. And they're all like understanding and moving things around. And I feel very grateful that I was able to pick myself up so quickly. Because I thought this time if I ever went out again, there was no fucking way I was coming back. I really didn't think there was. And it took one look from somebody I cared about and I'm like, nope, not doing this. And how long did you say this lasted? It was like a solid week of drinking. Oh, a week. Damn. Like a solid week of drinking. Yeah. Yeah, that was my curiosity when you brought that up with the question I had had now that I recall. Like, and when I tell you, like, solid week of fucking drinking. Like, oh, uh, yeah. Solid. Yeah. And I uh, first confessed to my mom because I, I don't ever want to keep anything from her or my dad. Sure. But she's a town crier, so she told everyone. Oh, shit. <laughs> and I was just like, okay. Your mom and my mom should hang yeah, out. I know, right? I'm like, mom, <laughs> that's not how this works. You've got to let me be the one to go to them to tell them because it's my journey. Right. But she was just trying to help. So it, like, I know. You know, so I... I I uh, then was like, and then I immediately called my therapist, immediately signed myself up for the thing, and then I did my post because I have to hold myself accountable and I have to be honest with the people who have looked to me for hope and inspiration. And I cannot tell you the fucking outpour of people who contacted me. That is enough for me to never want to drink again. It was so beautiful. It was so kind. All and, the love. Oh my God. Yeah. Like if you made me cry. Mm -hmm. Like it was so nice and everything that I fucking needed to hear. And it's like people like that are what keep me sober. And like I thank them so much. I don't know them. Mm -hmm. I'll probably never meet them in my life. But those little messages that they send me like kept me going yesterday when I was like, I don't know if I can do this. And it is like, I, I didn't think I was going to cry. <laughs> It is, it's so fucking difficult, man. It's not, it's not just like you go to treatment and then you're solved and everything's fixed and you're going to move on and everything's going to be great. Every fucking day is a battle. Mm -hmm. Every day is a battle because my mind works differently. Yeah. And it, it never will be a mind that, like, I was like, I can do that. I can have a glass of champagne. I can like, be normal. There is fucking nothing normal about me. I do that shit all the time. That that thing. Ah! I, got, I got the quick corrector now. <laughs> you know the worst. The worst part. And and I was talking with a buddy about that. He goes, "When's the last time you thought about drinking?" Funny you're making fun of me with NASCAR. I go, "Oh, I was watching the NASCAR race." He you goes, think how good would be a be? He goes, "Fucking what?" I go, "Well, I'm barbecuing. My kids are there. 
Uh, you know, it's Sunday, and it hits the TV right in front of me. Yeah. And there's a car going around the track with it. It's like, it's just a fucking thing I have yeah. to check. This is actually how my love of, <laughs> like, Same, stuff. same. Do you want to, yeah. I started drinking fizzy water because <laughs> yeah. it replaced, because I, I know this sounds really bougie. I was addicted to champagne. Like, champagne was my drink. I loved the taste of it. I could drink it all day, all night, no matter what. I, like, to me, it was like Sprite. Like, I didn't. Yes. And so when I didn't have the bubbles, I was like, what the shit am I gonna do to replace that? So I went straight to like any, like Perrier, any kind of fizzy, like the fizziest waters I could find. And it really does help, it's weird how that does Oh help. yeah, the sparkling water yeah. companies, I should have invested in their stock. Like, I know, it's crazy. I don't know, I don't know <laughs> who's bought like $500 worth of fizzy water in the last month, but keep it going it's nuts but it, it's weird how little things like that help yeah let's jump back a little bit because i you know we've only seen you know your family as it's been put on tv and written and everything but kind of tell a little more about what was kelly like growing up you know a lot of people of course don't know you and jack aren't the only kiddos but um so jack and i and my mom and dad we did the reality show mm -hmm. and i was already an addict by then before really? the show started. And how old were you when that, like 15? I was 15 when I signed the contract, 16 when it aired. Okay. Um, I was living in the Sunset Marquee Hotel and I used to put pajamas on, climb out my bedroom window, down a tree, into the bar and sit there and clean the glasses and they'd make me Malibu pineapple. And this was like back in the day when no one cared. Like there was no Lindsay Law or like, right. I, I went to the Rainbow, the Roxy, the Whiskey. I was out at clubs like Las Palmas. Um, I lived off Las Palmas. Like, every, like I was at everything from like 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And I started straight with opiates. Oh my God. Never did weed, never did alcohol. It, it was opiates. And then I didn't really like that anymore. Mm -hmm. So then I discovered that if I drank, I would always have fun. I, and I didn't really get hangovers. And I could drink in a way that most men couldn't drink. And later on, we did, I did this like geno testing and discovered that my father and I have this gene that metabolizes alcohol and um, uh, chemicals, like any form of narcotic mm -hmm. or medication faster than others. That's why like my antidepressants that I'm on now, I have to take one in the morning and one at night because my body metabolizes it too fast. Yeah. So that's why I was able to keep up and do what I was doing is like, and hide it like I could, because like no one knew, my mom didn't know. And then um, the Osbournes happened and I became very famous. Yeah. I turned into literally the most famous 16 year old girl in the world overnight and I couldn't understand why. Sure. Cause the truth is I didn't really fucking <clears throat> do anything. Like, just, I was just being myself, existing. I was a kid. How I was did you existing. feel about it? Like when you knew you were famous, were you stoked? Or were you kind of like, eh? Or were you like, hell yeah. Like, okay, so it, it's weird because I'd always want to, like, we were in MTV, I was a kid. I was like, this is just fucking cool. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Like, I didn't think I was famous. I thought my dad was famous. Right. And it was just like, we were the, like, the people in the background, I thought it was going to be a show about my dad. I didn't think that it was going to end up being based about all of us and right. like, focus so much on me and in one day I went from being able to do whatever the fuck I want no one knew who I was to having to have two security guards a um, driver I couldn't do anything by myself I had to have someone with me at all times suddenly I was fat suddenly I was ugly suddenly I was spoilt so and, I, and this was everything that everybody was saying and I was like but I don't understand like I was just being myself, what's wrong with me? Like, because my f family's wealthy, now I'm spoiled. Because, you know, you, I'm not a size zero in LA, I'm fat. Like, it was just like, it got to me and I couldn't fucking handle it. But when I drank, I was like, I'm fucking great. I don't yeah. give a shit what anyone thinks of me. Yeah. And I was like, fuck it, and it numbed it. And I was, a, I'm a number, I'm not a partier. Yeah. I was never the girl that's like, 
let's do this line and fucking go out and have fun. Like, coke was never my thing. I don't get it. Who wants to do coke and then have to take a shit in a public place? Like, that's like the fucking worst thing ever. I never understood that about people on coke. It was my shit. I loved coke. And I'll tell my thing with it is you could be hammered because my drink was Jack and Coke. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you're a Jack and Coke Coke guy. Jack and Coke oh, and Coke. Coke guy. Okay. Jack, I, Coke get, Coke. I totally get that though. So when you're hammered and then you do Coke, you're sober, you're good. It's like you sober up, but you're still drunk and you're in the best mood ever and everything's great. I got a rock in my pocket. The night is still young, but the next day, oh my gosh, the next day. Like you say, you never got hungover. I get hangover still to this day watching people drink. Like my See, I never, it bad. never really, I, sometimes I would get it, but like, I remember the first time I gave myself alcohol poisoning. Like, I, we were filming the Osbournes. I had a huge fight with my parents. They grounded me. I jumped out of the window and went my thing, climbed down a tree, <laughs> left. And I was so hysterical. I didn't know uh, what like Xanax was at that time because mm-hmm. it was still wasn't really a thing yet. Right. And my friend was like, oh my God, you're having a panic attack, take half of this. And I, it was so light, I didn't feel it, but it stopped the panic attack. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know if you drink that with alcohol, what happens. Oh, yeah. So I went out drinking that night with my friends and oh my fucking God, gave myself alcohol poisoning. My mom and my brother had to take me to the hospital. It was so embarrassing, it was fucking horrible, but that didn't stop me. You know, it's like, what's it gonna take to stop you? For me, I was lucky because I wasn't one of those people that lost their job, lost their family, lost their home. I still was working. Mm -hmm. I had a great fucking career, I was working every day. I reached a spiritual low where I was like, I want to die. Mm and I don't want to live like this anymore. And I also had survivor's guilt because all my friends kept dying. Yeah. Oh, shit. So it's that whole thing of like, why am I still here? And it's clear to me now that I'm here because that's what God's will is. Absolutely. And yeah. I'm here to be a better person and every single day, even before the relapse, like, I wanna make myself a better person. I wanna make the world a better place. I wanna do good. I'm, I don't, I'm not one of those people that sits there looking for faults in other humans. That's a quality that I lost when the first, this, with the last yeah. sobriety. Like, I don't judge people. I, when I see somebody who I think is doing something stupid, my first thought is, I wonder what's going on to mm-hmm, make them yeah. do that. That sucks. Yeah. Like, right, you are, and, and if people aren't following you on social media, I mean, that's one of the things that you're just, you're incredibly passionate about what you're passionate about. Yeah. And it's your superpower. It is, it's, it's like, I'm sorry, like, trans rights is one of my biggest things that I fight for because I fucked up with the trans community and didn't know that you couldn't say certain words. Sure. And this was years and years and years ago. And this journalist from the trans advocate contacted me and opened my eyes to something Mm -hmm. and it put me on a mission because my whole life i've just been fighting to be myself Mm -hmm. and i've been labeled everything that i'm not racist fat ugly spoiled well i'm a bit spoiled um (laughs) uh, you know like rude i'm not rude like because I stand up for myself doesn't make me rude. Yes. You know, I believe in equality, equal rights. <clears throat> I believe in love for everybody. Like I, that's, that's me. But like the trans community is the one that hits home most for me because all they're trying to do is be themselves mm-hmm. and there is fucking nothing wrong with it. And they're just born in the wrong body. Yeah. That's all that it is. They're just born in the wrong body. Their mind and their soul is a different gender and from their body. And there's nothing wrong with that. And the fact that what's been going on with like trans violence and every day somebody is getting killed and no one's doing anything. I've joined with this amazing organization called Glitz and what they're doing is fucking incredible because a lot of trans people end up having to become sex workers to survive. Yeah. And so what they do is they've built the very first housing for anybody who is trans and a sex worker or just trans and doesn't know where to live, like taking people off the piers in New York and actually giving them a place to live so that they can start, get a job, get clean, get what it is they need and start their life as the woman or man they're meant to be. 
and it's such an incredible I love them so much when I met the owner of it I got really emotional I started to cry <laughs> but my and and this is where I was really confused with like everything that went on with the Black Lives Matter because my whole thing was I've been fighting so hard for like gay rights, equality, love is love is love, everyone counts, everyone matters, all lives matter kind of thing. I had no idea that saying that was disrespectful because right. all lives don't matter until black lives right. matter. Right. They don't. All lives do not matter until black lives matter. Right. And this country is going through the great deprogramming. I went through it myself. I went through this whole thing where I was like, I didn't know this was going on. Mm -hmm. What the fuck is wrong with me? I need to educate myself. I had no idea about systemic racism. I didn't know about redlining. I didn't know about unconscious bias, like any of that. And it's been a wonderful experience re-educating myself and learning about things that I didn't know about and understanding why we are here right now in the world that we're living in. and the mess that has created because it, it's got to stop yeah it's, just, it's time I, it's enough yeah but i understand that the education process is difficult for some and people don't know how to do it and we're still being educated in the way that we're supposed to educate each other so it's going to be a slow process and i just hope that the world has a little bit more patience for one another while we're going through this change and, and this great deprogramming and that's the key and, and i think what we have to do as individuals, is take a look in the mirror and go, what's our part in it? Exactly. You know, we, we, we go, we see it, we go, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's that, it's an addiction, it's whatever it is. We just go, ah, oh, man, that's terrible, I feel for them. But it's like, it's, it's our fucking world. But it's also like, I have a lot of friends that literally don't have any black friends, and I think that's so strange. You know what, though? But if you think about it, when you talk about anything systemic, too, that it just tends to happen with communities. And it's I so strange to me. Like, I've never had that in my life. I have literally grown up in a world where, like, you have to remember, on these tours, there were freak shows. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was like every kind of human being you could imagine in, like, the freakish way. But also, like, I've been surrounded by trans people, gay people, like, it's been like a rainbow my whole life. So I, because I just thought because I'm not racist and I thought that because everybody I hang out with isn't, that that was enough. It's yeah. not enough. Yeah. It is not enough. You have to be actively not racist. And I have made mistakes in the past. I've tried to fall back on uh, sarcastic humor to make a point and it went terrible. And I'm still spending, that's one of the things in my amends is like making it up to the communities that I in the past had disrespected, you know, unintentionally. But it, it was a beautiful education for me. Yeah. So you did a living amends with it. Yes. A living amends, like the living amends is what's most important to yeah. me. It's funny, you're sitting there talking about the traveling freak show and I'm just having flashbacks to like going to OzFest. Do you know what I'm talking oh, about? I was like, there. I was there. There was like, we had like, Everything you could, and every kind of person you could imagine, yeah. all the time, and like I saw the craziest shit growing up. <laughs> like you have to remember, like I, like the first time I ever drank wild turkey was with Pantera. Oh fucking Christ! Like jeez! Like <laughs> I just remember Phil and Dimebag. Oh, they were like, "You want to try this?" It was like I was like, "Yeah, go on," and they would hide up because they had this dressing table with this uh, black velvet. Uh, like I would say tablecloth over it mm. and they would give us drinks and we'd hide under there and my mom would come in looking for us because she'd like I, if she goes I fucking know you guys are up to something where are my kids and they're like we don't know but we were under there and then I remember Dimebag always used to give me um, the silk bags that the Crown Royale Crown came Royal in bag, yeah. because I would use them to keep my underwear in and my suitcase because that way it was like separated yeah, from yeah and i thought that they looked nice and, and, <laughs> I and then i kept my hot wheels in them yeah and then it was like and then it became that's so funny and then i was like oh i like the crown royale way better than the wild turkey because the wild turkey burnt and made me throw up oh wild turkey <laughs> Ugh, no yeah <laughs> oh shit that's funny where you are now may not be where you came from the choices you make today may spiral out of control or spin you in the right direction 
Discover a riveting true story of how Carlos Vieira nearly destroyed his life and lived to tell about it. Stand up, stand firm, believe, make it happen, and live through the madness. Knocking doors down along the way. And don't miss others telling their powerful stories on our podcast. Visit kddmediacompany.com. Um, but I was going to say, the people, some of those people in rock, who were some of like your favorites that you had, that you kind of developed a cool bond? Oh my God, all the boys in Incubus. I mean, specifically Mikey. Mikey's like a brother to me. Yeah. They we seem s- like they would be cool. Oh my God, you've no idea. They were my big brothers growing up. Mm-hmm. Like I was with them on September 11th in New York. Really? Like the night before we went out, we went to go see Michael Jackson play at Madison Square Gardens. <coughs> I was meant to go and stay <coughs> with them at their hotel because we were going to do like a, a sleepover. And then, because like they were like my brothers mm. and I was like, I had this weird feeling. So I was just like, no, nah, I think my parents would be pissed off if I'm not there when I get back. Cause I'm still really young. And I woke up to their hotel was right next to the Twin Towers. So what they witnessed, I was so glad that I didn't have to see any of that. But then like going back to other, like, so all the guys in Pantera, they were all always like family to us. Um, but then also like, Jamie from Hatebreed. Um, Jamie Just is awesome. Uh, love him. Um, there was also crew guys that were just like family to us and still are, still hang out. Chris Abrego, they used to call him Condom Chris because he uh, was a part of one of the organizations where they handed out condoms to everybody at all the shows and we would raise money for like HIV awareness and stuff like that. Um, I'm trying to think. Because now I'm on the spot and like, if someone's going to be like, what about me? You forgot me. Um, <laughs> we mean to offend So all no the guys one. in Lincoln Park, um, I'm trying to remember like every, like, you have to remember like everybody was on oh these. My God. I'll tell you who else. Jonathan from Corn. He, he's been such an incredible friend to my father. Okay. Such an incredible friend to my father. He che- they check in with each other like every day. He's such a rad guy. Um, I remember Limp Biscuit, where like, he like Fred was always doing something where my mom had to come in and like fucking lay it down lay it down but then I also remember there were people on the tour that were like really fucked up and rude yeah that, like to you guys yes really uh singer of Iron Maiden being the number one really he used to go on stage and talk shit about my dad what? while he was on stage and then at the last and, and I will just say this the rest of his band is lovely the rest of Iron Maiden really are lovely yeah well, thank goodness because I adore Steve Harris's playing but every character Iron Maiden but it's <laughs> he would go on stage and talk shit about my dad and I don't get it I don't need a reality TV show to be famous like all of this shit like I never understood that thing, it, it, that trait in people, period. Like, and, and my dad would be in his dressing room, and he never knew about any of it. We never told him any of it. I was it. just going to say, what did he say about we it? We never fucking okay. told him, because he's not a, he's not the kind of guy, he would just be like, get the fuck off my tour. I don't think, yeah, yeah, he passes me off as somebody who wouldn't really even care. Like, if he heard about it, just be like, whatever. He's like, because he's like... He's fucking Ozzy Osbourne. Exactly. So like, he's, he's like, I'm sorry, he's like, good. he doesn't care. <laughs> But, like, I cared because it's my dad. Of course. So, at the last show, I got every one of my friends from the second stage. Oh, and the other guys are really cool with Slipknot. So, always, I love them so much. Um, Even they they helped. Some of the crew guys from Slipknot, I remember, like, like, literally, there was, like, 300 of us. We each had 100 eggs, and we were like, fuck you, and we pelted them at the last show. Oh, my God. I would have done the same. And don't, don't like, talk don't, shit about family. Don't talk shit about my dad. Yeah. Don't talk shit about my mom. Don't sh- talk shit about my dad. Cause I'm I'll surprised come for you. it never got to him. Like ever, like people hearing it and whatnot. Like it never got relayed back to Ozzy. Like, hey, dude, this guy's talking mad shit or whatever. We did uh, that last show the, because the he saw what happened, right. and then my mom pulled the plug on them half through through their set. It was fucking <laughs> love it. Now that sounds like your mom. Yeah, right. but I then I the, the, like I have like so no many memories of like business. Lemmy when I was growing up. Oh, and, like, I adore Motorhead. Like, and I always knew when Dad had been to Lemmy's house, we were like, oh fuck, Dad went to Lemmy's. He's gonna come back and be nuts. Like it was just like, and I would see Lemmy all the time because when I started going to the Rainbow, he'd always be at that right. one part, at the, his one seat at the bar that next to the slot machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's your dad? <laughs> like, and 
they, my dad and him, like they would collect Second World War memorabilia together. Yeah. So they would have like a lot of weird stuff that they would like find and talk about with each other. And, and they really were good friends. And I think that was a hard hit for my dad when, when he died. I can only imagine. Well, they were, they weren't born in the same town though. They were at different parts yeah, of England. Yeah, different parts yeah. of England. But I'm sure probably related Ooh. being close and you know, that yeah, post-World like, War II Exactly. You know. a, a growing up as your playground being a bomb site. So, yeah, yeah I could only imagine. Um, how now, in doing the steps in recovery, did that change your relationship with your dad? Because he's been there. We, you know, it's documented. It's been out there as well. Um, so much because we're able to talk to each other frankly now. Yeah. There's no like. I it took me teaching my dad how to talk to me which was hard because my dad likes to beat around the bush and I like to get to the point so I'm gonna get to the point yeah the point. <laughs> so he starts with a little birdie told me and I'm like no 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 <laughs> no little birdie told you mom told you and yes I did it and he's like okay but it was like things like that mm -hmm. and then we have the most incredible communication, my father and I do. And it's wonderful because I can go to him for a resource. I can go to him when I don't understand something. And he does give really good advice. Sometimes it's not what I want to hear, but right. he gives great advice. Well, he's lived so much life. Mm -hmm. It's like in, in so many experiences and, you know, and I, again, I think that's the superpower of a lot of people in recovery is that we have seen and gone and been resilient, resourceful, be it in our addiction and post it and everything else to really build a life mm -hmm. that I could, I could only imagine the, the advice that your dad or, or any of the, you know, you would get. He's really learned how to let go and let God. Mm. Like, he doesn't involve himself in any of the drama. He do, it's like, that's your shit. Like, I'm not feeding the animals. Like, he has really done incredible with that. And it's, I really admire him in, in that way. And I wish that I could be like him in my sobriety in that way. Because I'm like, I'm scrappy. You can get there. Yeah, really but want. it is what I'm working on. Yeah. But, like, I need to learn to not be... My, one of my biggest problems is that I don't pause. And pausing in sobriety is so important because usually your first thought is the wrong thought. Usually the wrong one. Yeah. And if you sit there, and now I have a two hour rule. What do you mean? So if I'm angry about something, if someone's pissed me off, if I get a text message that I don't like, if there's a situation that I am like, huh, like I wanna fucking rip someone's head off or I'm not happy or it's made me sad, I, don't do anything for two hours. Because in those two hours, you'll come up with all different things that you think that you should be doing. And that you might regret. And then you might regret. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're like, I'm just not gonna say anything. Yep. And you're not, then you're not involved in the drama. Oh. Or you come up with something where you're calm enough to set a boundary of saying, that made me uncomfortable, please don't do that again. Mm -hmm. Well, and we're so frequent in uh, um, addicts, we have a tendency to be storytellers. We tell ourselves this great story in our head of what all these things are and how everything, and we make it huge. But it's reality, so small. So small. Like, a perfect example of that is like, outside of my bedroom window, I can see this hiking trail. And every day I'd be like, that hiking trail, I could never do that. It looks so difficult. So fucking difficult. I told myself for four years I couldn't do it. A couple of weeks ago, I was like, I want to try it. I wasn't even out of breath. It wasn't difficult. It was the easiest thing I've ever done, but my mind had convinced me for so long sure. that I couldn't do it. But I did. Yeah. And it's like weird little shit like that that you're just like, this is why I'm crazy. Like, <laughs> this is why I'm fucking crazy. So, but I acknowledge my craziness. I like my craziness. I embrace it's it. What makes and, you you. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I am now like, okay, this is what we got to do to fix this. I'm Absolutely. not going to do this anymore. How are you doing amazing, Kelly? Thank you. You need to be proud of it. I am proud of it, but at the same time, I'm still a bit in that shame spiral because my ego is mad because I've lost my fucking time. <laughs> I know. I, well, and for anyone that may not, because it, we do count it. It is an achievement. It's and such it, an achievement. Like I said, every 24 hours that you can get through without numbing yourself yeah. is a fucking miracle. Yeah. And it is what, what, when you're an addict, 
you understand that. When you're not an addict, you will never get that. Mm -hmm. You'll never understand that. And then I also think that the program is a gift because we get taught how to be better people yes. and hold ourselves accountable and be honest. And it's, it's made me such a better person all the way around. But don't get mistaken. All of those people are in that room for a reason. Yes. You can't trust everybody. Yeah. You have to find your people. Yep. Like I will tell what you my, to stay in my first year of sobriety in uh, 2017, I met somebody who I have no resentment to now. I have let it go. But because she did help me and she did show me the program in a new light that I never saw before, which is why I think I fell in love with it so much. But this person lied to me about having cancer and lied to me about her situation. So I started paying for her and she was just stealing from me. And it was one of the hardest things I went through in early recovery because my mind told me, oh my God, these are good people. It's supposed to be like, yeah. and it, like, I was just like devastated. But I know that, that that was her issue. And thank God, like she did reach out to me to tell me, you know, she's doing well, she's sorry. Everything is different. She regrets what she did completely. I'm happy for her. But like, that's just not, I, I could never be friends with that yeah, again. Of course not. And, but there's no resentment. And sure. the program has taught me that. Before that, I'd be sitting here still being like, fuck that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not like that anymore. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's like, and that's the whole thing. It's like, not everyone you meet in the rooms is going to be a great person. But there are some fucking incredible people in those rooms. There's yeah. life-changing people in those rooms with stories that are your story that you listen to and you're like, oh my God, yeah, I get this. And you get these God shots and then you get excited and all of a sudden you realize that you're doing the right thing again. And my fucking God shot was one look. And I will be forever grateful to him for that. Yeah. One goddamn look. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I guess this party's over. Well, and it's funny because we start to... Because the, the things that most people would sit and go, I had someone disappointed in me in my life or screwed and messed up, whatever. But no, you just pointed out that shit becomes a gift that we don't realize mm -hmm. because I was like, you quick to react to everything yeah. because I want an excuse to turn this from this to a... a we won't name the beer company because they're not sponsoring. We wouldn't, we, we wouldn't take their fucking money anyways. Yeah, um, that's why this is facing this way. Right? <laughs> um, but we look so quick to that that reaction that we don't see those the, those God shots. Yeah, we don't see them as so much of a blessing because we're so used to everything panning out right then and there. And like instant understand. gratification, and when it doesn't, why me? I'm a fucking victim and all this shit. And I'm like, no. I'm a victim of myself and that is it. Mm. And I cannot do this. And I don't want to be Cali sober. That to me is a cop out. And it's, it's not sober. It's, a, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. To you're the you're, you're playing with fire and all of that. And like, I, I tried to be Cali sober for one week. Nah. How'd that go? <laughs> <they> go, go. <laughs> hey, welcome to the club. I'm like, <laughs> like crying, <laughs> eating fucking nachos and getting fucking like um, ranch dressing all down myself and like not even caring, like swigging from whatever fucking bottle I could find. And then it was like this person's fault for something and someone else fault for something else. And it literally just took one look at somebody that I truly fucking adore looking at me and I was like, nope, I'm done. Uh, it took one look. Well, we haven't met him, but we're, uh, we're damn thankful. We're grateful there. for him. Me yeah, too, yeah. me too. And that you got that look. And that's, that's the thing I think sometimes when that's people- That's our headline, the look. The, the look. look, I got the look and I was like, fuck it, I'm done. I think that's the thing too. Sometimes when people think about love, we think about all the fairy tale shit, and they don't think about moments like that. 
That to me is love. Yes. That to me, it, relationships are work. Like we're not at the stage yet where we say I love you to each other. Um, we've only been dating five months, but like, it's like I got happy. I got everything I ever wanted. He's like, honestly, the most healthy relationship I've ever been in. And scaring you? It scared the shit <laughs> out of me. And then I was like, what am I doing? Don't be scared, just roll with it. This is good, this like, is Like even good. last night, I sent him a psycho text message where I was like, you're breaking up with me, I mean, you're breaking up with me. And he's like, no, what are you talking about? I was like, sorry, I'm a real psycho right now. I've had two panic attacks today. Like, uh, like I'm done, like I did my therapy, I'm so sorry. And he's like, it's okay, I'm just glad that you, you came to this decision without me saying anything. And I said, oh, no, 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 motherfucker, you said something. It's yeah. just not with your mouth. Yeah, yeah. Like, it wasn't. And then it, like, I'm just very grateful. Yeah, that's incredible. That's awesome. Well, we like to have a little bit of fun before we leave you with the last words of encouragement. We just do some fun random questions. Okay, go on. Hit me. So right off the top, I'll let you start. Okay. Oh, we haven't done this one yet. If you, uh, well, that's kind of mean because it's, never mind, I won't ask that one. If they were to make a movie about Kelly Osbourne, who would you cast to play yourself? How old would I be? Oh, we got to do, yeah, I know, we got to like be more specific. Story. Right now. If, the, if you, it was my right age now, now yeah. it would be Jamie Winston. Okay. She's my twin. Mm -hmm. She's an actress from England. Her father's mm -hmm. Ray Winston, uh, who's also an incredible actor. And we both have the same tattoo. Like she, like everyone, we're together. They're like, oh my God, the twins are together. We are the same height, the same body. We're both English. We're both loud. We're both like opinionated. And like, that's who I would get to play me, for sure. I love right it. On. Right on. All right, I have to do this one. If you were stranded on a deserted island mm -hmm. and you had one movie and one music album to take with you, what would they be? Abbey Road. Oh, that was quick. And... Rocky Horror Picture Show. Really? Yeah. I love that movie. Abbey Road, I know your dad was a fan of the Beatles. Was it a thing between you and him? Did yeah, you still into is. It? Yeah? Still is. That's our jam. That's it's awesome. ELO and Abbey Road. ELO? Really? Yeah. My dad's in a real ELO kick right now. <laughs> That's funny. And it's so funny because my mom used to tour manage them. Oh, right. Yeah, you know so that. my mom managed them and co managed and tour managed them for years. And this was like before my dad. Yeah, so is and that when she was with her? Like my mom does so much cool shit. My mom worked on Xanadu. My mom managed ELO. My mom managed Smashing Pumpkins. Like all sorts of like, like you should like Quiet Riot. Or I just don't even remember all of these like Lita Ford coming in and out and like all these crazy fucking <laughs> different rock stars. Like I just remember being a kid swimming in the pool and seeing like Axl Rose by there with like just chilling with my dad yeah, like, and Slash Rose. and all time favorite. Just Slash is fucking amazing. Yeah. One of the nicest people in rock and roll. I swear to God, he is fucking awesome. And his kids are so cute. Oh my God, London, I can't. Um, and then like just like I don't even know. Like yeah. the craziest shit I saw when I was a kid. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, we have different childhoods. Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, why I love that question, too, is that the, the, the things that you find that, that art brings such connectivity. Because, mm -hmm. you know, my mom grew up here in Southern California, but a Beatles person. It's funny for you to say that because I remember that being on on the Saturday it, mornings when cleaning was happening. And, that's that's, my, that's what I do in the morning. Yeah. I listen to uh, pretty much, uh, but on vinyl, every, like every day. I love it. That's cool. And... It's, it's something that it is because of my dad. He, he is, I mean, hello. Uh, Lennon and Yoko. This is an original Imagine t-shirt. Love it. And I found it and I was like, I have to do what I have to do to get that shirt. And I was too fat for it when I bought it. And it was part of like my, my skinny winner goal to get skinny enough for it to fit Not me. Not fat, just <laughs> healthy. You're, I know, no, no, I was fat. I weighed over 200 pounds. Well, okay, I'm five foot you two. You wore it well. Thank you. <laughs> no, I was fat. Um, because, you know, like when you stop drinking, you're like, I need yeah. the food. And, and that's what happened. And then I found out that my body was overproducing a hormone that told me that I was starving all the time. So mm. it would store everything as fat. Mm -hmm. So then I had the surgery and it really helped me like full circle. And then life just got so perfect that I had to fuck it up. Uh, you didn't fuck but it you're up. back on track now back and that's on track. what's important yes yes not a fuck up because you're here and you learn mm -hmm. and you got a god shot 
I got a real fucking god shot. <gasps> Which is cool. I love those. Me too. The I'm rude awakening god shots. I was like, motherfucker, <laughs> shit. You're up, Mikey. Okay. What are some of your pet peeves? Are you ready for my number one thing? Let's hear it. Please. I have a phobia called misophonia. And it is sound based. So I, ha I, I have sound sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's part of my ism or what. But repetitive tapping, mouth noises, loud chewing, um, people clicking with their mouth can make it. It does. It, it's so strange that it causes a physical reaction. Like my knees buckle. I've walked up to people and put my finger in their mouth and pulled their gum out, and I don't even know them. That's why I can't go to movie theaters because I can't stand people eating popcorn. If you put me in a room with a fucking beatboxer, I'll lose my goddamn mind. Right when you were explaining those, I'm trying to think: Did I do any of those during this interview? No. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I, I, I think. I, to, uh, no, because my, my, my daughter and I believe her mom to a certain extent as well have it. And uh, it's so bad. Everyone in my family knows. They're like, "Don't do that." <laughs> well, the funny part was like we were coming back. And we had an interview before you. We were, you know, coming from the other side of L.A. almost, and I'm like. Man, I, I wish I bought some gum or something. I hope my breath doesn't stink. I lucked out. Thank goodness. All right. So you know, I, I don't. I can't chew gum because I don't like the sound of it in my head. Oh, even you're you making yeah, the sound. Yeah, no, it's candy. not. It's not exclusive oh, to any sure. anyone. Like I can't chew gum because I don't like the way it sounds. It freaks me out. What about you eating chips? It's really difficult. I have to put loud music on. Wow. Really? Yeah. So anything crunchy or? Yeah. So it's. It's really weird. Like I, it, it's. It's not weird. It's it's just what makes you unique about. It's like, but it's always you. been like that my yeah. whole life. So that is like, and my other pet peeve is people who pretend to be people they're not. Mm. I I don't have time for that. Like. I like that. That could I, be one of mine. I have millions. I like. But I don't like that either. You're like, right. and also a pet peeve of mine is sand because it's the gift that keeps on giving. You can't get rid of it. You go to the beach <laughs> and it's with you for the fucking rest of your life. <laughs> uh, I hear you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's another one. I was well, like, what maybe else you should me? stop because now I'm realizing I have so much more because it's like, <laughs> I fucking hate sand too. Sand? Like, no. <laughs> okay, like, you when, when, So, like, Bobby will even tell you, like, when I even was, was living in Malibu because I moved to Malibu for, like, two and a half years, almost three years. Yeah. And, like, how many times did I go to the beach? Yeah. <laughs> Zero. I was like, nope. I like beach day? Nope. nope. Well, like, we'll go to the beach, but it's like, I'm not going on the sand. Like, I'll chill, like, up here yeah, with the Yeah, I would walk Zuma. We did our walks on Zuma Beach, but that was it. And like, then, I, then that's, yeah. Oh, no, no. See, I love the water. But I'm not big a big fan of the the come out of the water, yeah. then you get it all get stuck on you, get dirty, the sand. And then yeah. you get in the car, and then you gotta get the vacuum, and, and then you, you get know, the khakis, and then no, you get. And right. then you're in bed at nighttime, and you're like, "What the fuck is this shit in my bed? It's sand." <laughs> it found its way in there. Yeah. But it's sneaky. Fucking <laughs> you're up, buddy. Oh, uh, what's another good one that we like to go to? Oh, if you could have dinner with any one person, living or not, who would it be? Oh, that's so tough. Anyone right. in the world. And there no, are, are no wrong answers. It's just kind of maybe narrowing it down to one of the people. I don't want to, like, it's so cliche because everyone always like, Elvis Presley, Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> like, I don't, like... I'd love to have dinner with the Queen. Really? Yeah. I find her to be so admirable and, like... She's given her life of service to a country. And like, I'm a royalist, I love the royal family. So I think that, that's who I'd like to have dinner with. Yeah. I've had dinner with all the other members of the royal family, just not her. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's cool. That is a new one. All right, Mikey, last, that's last awesome. random question. Random question, random question. <laughs> I'm gonna ask it anyway. If you can get rid of one state in the United States, which one would it be, and why Florida? No. See what I I had to, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just gonna. No. Ask. Look. Uh. It's so weird because like there's so many beautiful parts of Florida as well. Like I've been and had like incredible the times of Florida. So I don't know. 
I don't know what state because I believe that if you if I picked a state, then it would become political, and I don't want to be political right now. Exactly. Yeah. That's why I was um, hesitant on so asking. Like, well, it's just fun. Jackass. It's just, you know, it's like, just like, Florida, like just kidding. And like, I love you. I, like I, I fucking love Miami. So yeah. it's like of course, but. And when you think about it, they've done a great job with the vaccine rollout in, in Florida. So, yeah. it, you know, every state has their issues. I think it's it's just about making the community that you live in a better place. Yeah, sure. It's about doing your part. Uh, it, it like that's why I joined um, uh, part of the, the LA County uh, Sheriff's police department mm -hmm. at, as their advisory committee it's like and what we do is we i think it's an incredible program what they're doing and i think it's going to be a great <clears throat> solution to what has been going on mm -hmm. with the police and the training because what we get to do is go into the community see what problems are really going on and then we have a monthly meeting different chapters like there is a race chapter i'm a part of the lgbtq chapter mm -hmm. there is a finance chapter there is like there is all different groups and we come together and figure out what we can do to make a difference what protocols we can put in place that would make it easier for police to communicate with situations that are going on because my whole theory on it is yes i'm going to protest because i think what happened was wrong sure but if you want to make it right, you've got to go in there and you've got to work from the inside and you've got to do your part. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to sit here and just say, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and uh, equal rights for gays and LGBTQ, all of it. No, I'm involved. I'm a part of it. You don't just say it, you do it. Right, yeah, right. Like that is part of the problem with what's going on right now. People are jumping on bandwagons and not doing the work. Right. Do the work, educate yourself learn about what's going on be a part of the solution don't be a part of the problem and stop being violent mm -hmm. and that goes to both sides yeah yeah and it's 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 one of these things where you don't get to suppress anyone anymore ever and everybody gets to be equal and everybody gets to have their turn mm -hmm. and it's something like, I'll honestly say, like with everything that's been going on that I didn't know about, truly made me embarrassed to be white. Hmm. But it's like, we have to sit here now and, and do our part to make up, the, the, make up for the wrong of our ancestors. That's what we get to do. Mm -hmm. And that's why I look at it as like, this is great. That's the way I look at it like, hey, this is great because right. now we get to make a difference. <clears throat> we get to be a part of the solution. We're no longer a part of the problem. And it's all about education and it's all about patience mm -hmm. and understanding that this is a time for people like myself to shut up and listen mm -hmm. and let everyone else do the talking for a minute. Let the pendulum swing in the other way. It will come back and things will settle. Mm -hmm. And I think we're in that right now. And I hope so. I really, really hope so. Because I don't think freedom of speech should be taken away from anybody. I don't think that... Um, a community should be suppressed or subjected to less than for any reason other than not just being qualified. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Like the most qualified person should always get the job. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Yep. And that's what, what it's all about now. And, and I, it's been uncomfortable. It's been horrible. I've learned a lot, but at the same time, it really, I can't say it enough. We're watching the world change. And we just don't know what's gonna happen, so that's scary. But yeah. today's a perfect example of how it can change in a good way. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. that with, with the court case, with everything, with, you know, it's time for justice to be served. It's time for people to be held accountable. It's time for the education, for everyone to self-educate and, and, and do the right thing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy I'm a part of it. And I hope that that's one thing, if any, anything to come out of is we're all accountable for ourselves and our own actions and our contributions to this world. Yeah. But people need to stop pointing fingers and labeling people things that they're not and start looking at themselves and, and do their work. Yeah. And, it, and it's okay, people. It's really okay to go, I know nothing about that. And then that's when this closes and you open. Yes. 
That's if okay. you don't know, say, I'm sorry, I'm ignorant, I need to re-educate myself, then shut up. Yeah. And it's, it, it's, it's a scary world right now. You can't do right for doing wrong, and when you think you're doing right, you're still pissing someone off. Yeah, and that's just the access, a- accessibility, as you well know mm-hmm. more than us, but, you know, millions of people, and then everybody's got to comment and tell, unless they were sitting face to face. Yeah. Then and it then changes real it quick. It changes so Keyboard fucking quick. Guys, yeah. Oh my God, keyboard cowboys. Mm-hmm. Oh, but I'm a fucking psycho. I find these people. <laughs> oh, I don't give a shit. And then I educate them. I'm like, hey, what's up? Uh, Say it to my face. What's up? Mm-hmm. Like, I've called people, I found people's phone numbers and FaceTime them. Really? What's up? Say it to my face. You really think that? Like I, the other day I was driving and there was like an accident. So I had to move to get around it. Mm. And somebody didn't want to let me in, but there was nothing else I could do. And this person was like screaming at me, calling me a bitch, saying I'm a terrible driver. And I rolled down your window, had my window and what's up? Say it to my face. Mm. What is up? And they looked at me though. They realized it was me. They're like, holy fuck. And they started to laugh. And I'm like, no. What's your fucking problem? Mm-hmm. You just sat here saying it. Say it to my face. And he went, y- y- you're a terrible driver. And I went, I know. And then he was like, s- shocked. Like he couldn't handle it. Mm-hmm. Like, he just say the truth. I just you're, like, you're, you're, the, I know. The, as you see the fact of my fucking face. Yeah. Yeah. Say it. If you're going to say it, say it to my fucking face. And then we can have a conversation about mm-hmm. it. Right. That's the way I am. I, I'm not a fan of keyboard cowboys. I'm not a fan of council, co- council culture. I'm a fan of council culture where we educate each other, where you gently give people a nudge in the right direction. You say, I understand that you wouldn't know, but this is what you should be doing. And it's something that like, even in the program, like recently, like a young person that I talk to and help um, gave pills to somebody who was manipulating them and Mm -hmm. said, if you don't give these to me, I'm gonna go get heroin. Mm -hmm. He didn't know what to do in that situation. So everything's learning. I wouldn't sit here and be like, fuck you, why did you give him, why did you give him that? Like, you can't give him he, pills, he's a heroin addict, he's gonna go straight back to heroin, what the fuck are you doing? Instead, I called him, I said, what happened? Okay, you're, he's like, what? Like, he's still a teenager, he doesn't get it. Mm-hmm. Like, it's like, this person was well in their 40s and just manipulating a kid. Mm-hmm. So I just said, look, hey, not your fault, you didn't know, but in this situation, this is what you do. And he's like, thank you so much. And like that, that's how you move forward in things like this. You educate and you try to just gently nudge people in the right direction. You lead the horse to water, but you can't make them drink. That's where the work comes in on every individual person. Right. And it just is like remarkable how stubborn people are. Mm -hmm. They're just like, oh yeah, I'm a part of this cause because if I don't look like I'm a part of this cause, people are gonna think I'm a racist or people are gonna think I'm a bigot or people are gonna think whatever the fuck. Like, or I'm a bully, like, really learn about the cause. Be a part of it. It's so much fun to do. Yeah. Like, I love all the work I do with, like, like and I don't brag about it because all the different organizations I work with, because I don't believe that's why you do it. I do it because it makes me feel good. It really does, which mm-hmm. is selfish, but still. That's a good selfish thing. Mm-hmm. That's the thing we get to do. And, you know, that's, that's me right now in a nutshell, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, you're fucking awesome. This is great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I did click. I'm sorry. No, it I didn't even about hear it. Five I said, you son of a bitch. You just said it. I was waiting for her to look, at, look over. And we'd be like. <sighs> oh, well, really appreciate it. Thank you. This is a total.